I have been a gamer pretty much since I could walk or talk. Um, started off in, I guess, first grade playing Dungeons and Dragons with my siblings. Uh, they recruited me because one of their players didn't show up. This is in 1981, I think, and so I was about this tall, so they made me a halfling, and off I went to, uh, I think I keep on the Borderlands was, the, uh, was that adventure. So that started a love affair with gaming, specifically D&D. I went through a Robotech phase, I went through a Shadowrun phase. In the 90s, I went through a Vampire phase. Started playing video games too, starting with a Commodore 64 and the Atari, and expanding into the IBM and so forth and so on. So when it came time to go to college, instead of studying Kellogg's or Procter & Gamble, I studied Nintendo and Wizards of the Coast, well, at the time, TSR. And uh, really kindled the love affair and realized that, gosh, there's a business here. And so my first job in the industry was as an intern at an outfit in London. My first paying job was as a reviews editor for a magazine, uh, ePlay magazine. It didn't last very long. Uh, but my first actual real job was at Amazon launching their computer and video games uh, business. And while I was there, one of my favorite web comics was Penny Arcade. And I would go there to get information, find out what's new, and but just also to laugh. When they announced PAX, I was at my five-year mark at Amazon. I really wanted to get out of there, and so I called up and said I could help out with PAX. And I hung up the phone, and I thought about it for a second, then I called back and said, no, I can actually really help out with PAX. And uh, they said, all right, um, I can't really afford to pay you. I'm like, don't. Like, If it works, hire me. But if it doesn't, hey, we all had a good time, and it wound up working. We created this festival as one big tent. Everyone's welcome, right? The very first PAX was video games, computer games, tabletop games, right? None of this tribalization. Everyone's here to have a good time. Whatever you're into, you can find it here. Let's all come on in. And one of the fascinating things we saw was we were closing down the expo hall at PAX East. But to get everyone out, we had to push them out of an exit. And we pushed them out through the tabletop area because that's where most of the exits were. It just made logistical sense. But what we saw by that happy accident was that people stayed. Video gamers and computer gamers, which is mainly what that expo hall is at PAX East, stuck around and sat down and started playing tabletop games. And we're like, this is great. The origin story of this show, PAX Unplugged, was we looked at that from the sky bridge at PAX East and we're like, yeah, if you just take this section, this footprint, and get rid of everything else and just take this, that's a show. Why don't we just do this as a, and then we did, and that's PAX Unplugged. Gathering around in person with a table is, that's humanity, that's community, that we are a tribal species, right? We, we, we want to gather around that fire. One of the things that, as discovered as a parent, as far as parenting advice goes, you always hear is, hey, it's very important to sit down with a meal with your family, right? Don't let people eat in front of the couch or take food up to their room or grab it on the way home or whatever. Take that moment, sit down. It's a chance to bond, to tell stories. But as a nerd, as a gamer, what you realize is that it doesn't have to be a dinner table. It could be a game table, doing the exact same things. You're gathering around, you're together, you're sharing, you're helping, you're learning. That need, that human need of face-to-face -face interaction is facilitated by this hobby, this pastime. I had the pleasure of, of playing a game called Inheritance, uh, which is a Viking funeral. And uh, it was such a great experience that I, for my birthday, uh, my buddy Eric threw that in my backyard. So I'm a big SEA guy, I LARP, like all that stuff. So I've got, geez, gosh, going on 30 years worth of costumes now, and, and just gear and chain mail and armor and weapons, all that good stuff. And so he throws this Viking funeral, um, there's torches, there's a big table with, with Viking food prepared by Darlin, and all my buddies show up, my dear friends, and they're all looking good because I catered them out. Um, there's the priest, there's the berserker, there's the Torvald, the Viking king, and, and all these, these characters in this intense you know, woods background at night, drinking mead. And the character that played uh, by my wife was my in-character's wife. Right? So I was the Viking king, she was the Viking queen. She confessed that she had murdered our son because the son was trying to kill her. And tears were coming out of my eyes because I, as a father and as a husband, 
it was very easy to make that real in that moment. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. That was real. That was emotional. I think the role playing has, has been very beneficial on that, on the business side. Managing resources, managing information, and, and what would the other person want, right? So I come to business from the sales side. That was always my primary role is how does this make money, right? Um, and the easiest way to make that effective is to say, all right, how, how can this actually be of value to you? I'm not asking you for money. I'm giving you an opportunity to get something of value, right? And to put yourself in their shoes and, and to role play as them and think, all right, well, what is this person actually looking for and how do I best present that to make it easy for them to recognize that that's what I have to offer? So that's rough. It's hard to balance uh, your professional life with your, with your pastime and, and your passion sometime. Gosh, try having a, you know, both a job and a marriage and children. And, you know, if you can go back to those heady days in high school or middle school when you could just pretty much roll the dice for initiative on Friday after school and stop playing technically Monday morning, let's be honest, it's not Sunday anymore, and to not sleep in that interim. Like, you can't do that as a functioning adult. Um, but, you know, um, I think one of the things we did at Penny Arcade was create a community where you can do that, like PAX. PAX is a great place to come and meet up with friends that you haven't seen in a while. You, you've got focused time, right? You're here. You're here for one purpose, and that's to play. And so I, I think game conventions like um, PAX and the others around there are a great way to do that. I, uh, I'm from a wizarding family, I guess. I married another gamer, and in her profile, I think she had mentioned that she had a level 70 Lotro character. Right, and I was like, huh. Like, not only an MMO character, max level, but a, a niche Lord of the Rings. Like, yes, I will meet this person. Like, we met up, and you know, we talked about a lot of different things, but being able to just say, here is a, a piece of me that is very intimate, that might not be well understood, but we instantly connect on that level was great. One of the ways that I announced that I was having a uh, a kid was I said I'm making a new character right like gamers by their very learned nature are helpers they are uh, people who run towards problems they are people who will say yes I will give you this goal to help you get your wagon out of this thing like we, we want to solve problems we want to help and I think being a parent naturally trains you to consider all right how do I help this person become all they can be? How can I develop this character? What are the resources that are necessary? Nutrition, you know, moral compass, uh, obviously education, to give this person the best possible opportunity for success. Like we go through this hundreds of times. It's kind of funny when we were first launching Child's Play. We were in our twenties. Like we didn't know what we were doing. It was a stunt. It was a uh, two middle fingers to some soul editorial writer who said that gamers were psychopaths on driven mad by murder simulators like nonsense we're like this guy like who thinks that that's not true and who wants to demonstrate that send us a toy send us a we'll drop it off at Seattle Children's Hospital and it was a quarter million dollars in two weeks and we're like whoa that's that's not a stunt anymore that's a that's a responsibility that's a that's a mandate to do good. Um, and we, I think we're successful with Child's Play, we being the community, not just PA, but the, the community, um, because we made it easy to give. We made it 100% transparent. We, we set up Amazon wish lists. You want to send a toy to Seattle Children's? Go to their Seattle Children's wish list, hit buy, it sees the delivery address of Seattle Children's. Like, it's no obfuscation, no taking a cut or whatever it was, it's just clean and transparent and easy and true um, and of course over the years we've built it up and the community responded with their own events and freaking desert bus and all the rest so I think what we're what I'm most proud of I think would would be giving the community this generous giving community an opportunity to to do what's in their nature which is to help others Gamers help. Gamers run towards trouble, you know? Gamers, give them the opportunity and they will change the world.